Borneo. What comes to mind? Misty mountains and vast forests with towering trees. Wild animals and plants so strange they must be seen to be believed. Indigenous people living in harmony with nature? Well, there's plenty of that, but the story's much more complex. In this film, you will experience some of these unique ecosystems, witness their diversity and complexity, and hear stories of our intricate relationships with the ecosystems on which we rely. We start at the tropical montane cloud forests, Forming at altitudes from 900 to 3,500 meters, these unique ecosystems are not only the important headwaters of streams, but they also regulate climate through their strong influence on cloud formation. Plants transpire drawing water from the soil and releasing it into the atmosphere during photosynthesis. This high rate of evapotranspiration is made visible where moisture-laden air masses are forced up the mountains to form a misty fog in the cool morning air. Trees are draped with epiphytes, such as mosses, liverworts, ferns and orchids. The epiphytes thrive in these montane forests, acting like sponges, obtaining and retaining water that condenses off the tree canopy. In this condensation zone, the soil is constantly wet and anoxic, giving rise to slow breakdown of organic matter and low soil nutrients. A group of plants here supplement this nutrient limitation by turning carnivorous. These are pitcher plants. Attracting and trapping insects into their pitchers, they break down their victims, extracting their nutrients instead. While the montane forests remain somewhat untouched by direct human activities thus far, it is gradually feeling the heat from climate change, and we find that the cloud zone has been shifting upwards little by little, until at the peaks of mountains there will be nowhere left to go. Organisms in the montane forests are highly specialised to the environmental conditions. When we lose the habitat conditions, we will also begin to lose species. Lower down the elevation, trees in the lowland forests of Borneo are nearly twice as tall as their Amazonian counterparts. These are the Dipteracarps. They dominate the landscape here, making up about 50% of the forest canopy. The tallest, supported by massive buttress roots, reaches 85 meters. That's equivalent to a 21-floor apartment. Around these trees, the forest teems with life, making use of every nook and cranny, nothing and nowhere left to waste. Within the canopy, swinging from tree to tree, the critically endangered northeast Bornean orangutan that calls the forest home Occasionally feeding on insects, fruits form the main part of the diet of these reddish apes, making them important seed dispersers, as they forage over large areas, pooping the seeds as they go. Although orangutans can survive to about 50 years of age, females only give birth to usually one baby every 5 to 10 years. Their bond is incredibly strong, with the mother staying with the baby for six to seven years. And here, the world's smallest bear, the sun bear. Named after their golden patch of fur, which resembles the rising sun, they are known as a keystone species. They also play an important role in maintaining the delicate equilibrium of the forest ecosystem through seed dispersal, nutrient cycling, and termite pest control. This is a termite colony, 
They play a key role in breaking down dead plant matter and returning nutrients back into the system. Scientists have even found that areas of forests with healthy termite populations are more resistant to drought and future climate change, as their munching and digging keeps the soil moist and prevents it from drying out. Some species, however, damage live trees in the forest, so their numbers must be kept in check. Enter the sun bear. With its long and powerful tongue, they can surge out termites, keeping the forest in its intricate balance. Unfortunately, the sun bears too face threats from habitat loss, and they are by no means alone. With creatures large and small, Borneian forests are some of the most biodiverse in the world. All these species call the forest their home, but their home is disappearing. Widespread exploitation of these ecosystems has and continues to take place as we use the forest as a resource. These forests contain some of the most highly valued tropical wood in the world. With hardwood species such as the dipterocarps and the Borneian ironwood coveted for their incredible strength and texture. Between 2004 to 2017, about 33% of Borneo's 5.9 million hectares of forest were lost. European demand for tropical hardwood once drove the loss of these lowland dipterocarp forests. Now, these forests supply a growing Chinese market. With the trees gone, old logging trails open new opportunities for agriculture. And what could be better than the world's most productive oil crop? Oil palms. Just a single hectare yields five tons of crude vegetable oil ready to fuel the edible oil, manufacturing and energy industries. Malaysia is the world's second largest producer of palm oil and Malaysian Borneo is a core part, pumping out nearly half of the country's palm oil. Depending on the price of palm oil, a single family who is given a 15 hectare oil palm plantation by the government could earn more than 160,000 ringgit a year. However, as plots of land are split further through family inheritance, this same yield must support a constantly growing group of people. While some people benefit from the oil palm industry, others, whose livelihoods are dependent on the natural ecosystems, are less lucky. Along the winding Sagama River, at the crossroads of the Tabin Reserve and a new oil palm plantation, lies Kampong Dagat. 180 Suluk Bajau, Tidong and Bugis people reside here. However, in recent decades, logging and then widespread conversion of their ancestral forests to oil palm plantations has changed their lives. My name is Najib Bin Ramsa. And I was born here in Kampung Dagat, Kinabatangan, Sabah. So Kampung Dagat is located in the middle between uh, Tabin Wildlife Reserve, which is protected areas, as well as uh, the largest Ramsar site in Malaysia, uh, wetlands, and and also we are, we are also uh, live next to the palm oil plantation. So it's like we are squeezed by this entities. As well as their territory being squeezed by land use change, these changes have also affected their main source of income. The people in Dagat, we are the fishing community. Our main income is fishing uh, since a long time ago. I still remember 10 years ago, there's no palm oil plantation nearby. Yeah, the, the river is clean and there's a lot of prawns and uh, fishes. Even if you can put Bubu, Bubu is a uh, prawn trap inside the river, just right next to, to our house, to my house. Uh, you can put it for one night and then if you look it for the next day, oh, a lot of prawns. That was like 10 to 15 years ago. But right now, since this uh, small company, 
they open up the lane and then they plant the oil palm and then we notice that the number of prawn is decreasing decreasing a lot uh, I think it's because of the the pesticide and also they use poison and maybe because of the, the landscape on the land has changed so I think that's why it affects the, the prawn in the, in the river The ecosystem is so rich here because they live next to Malaysia's largest Ramsar site, the Lower Kinabatangan Sagama Wetlands. At 79,000 hectares, entire countries could comfortably fit within the mangrove forests here. These mangroves are important nurseries for fish and invertebrates, and the continuous network of rivers and wetlands creates the rich bounty for the indigenous communities residing here. But it is a delicate system that has been affected by the logging and agricultural practices upstream. Erosion from the loss of forests and agricultural runoff from oil palm plantations into nearby riparian habitats can lead to downstream sedimentation and a number of issues for surrounding communities. Bioaccumulation of poisonous substances in aquatic animals, eutrophication and toxic blooms have all been documented, impacting the wildlife and the people of Dagat, who rely upon this ecosystem. In response to these changes, the village started to diversify their livelihoods. So that's why, uh, that's why we try to get help from the government, from other uh, non-government non agencies like uh, NGO, from like for example for example to help us to get out from this problem like to diversify our income so that we ju we don't just depend on uh, fishing activities but right now uh, we want to uh, diversify our income we already built sweet nest for uh, alternative livelihoods and also we try to develop our uh, ecotourism activities here in Kampung Dagat uh, and also we try to raise awareness among the people here, especially young people, so that we can, uh, we can continue to protect our uh, traditional uh, territories. Land use change has squeezed the people of Kampong Dagat and led them to seek alternative ways of life. This story is also repeated with the animals of Borneo. One example is Borneo's largest mammal, the Bornean pygmy elephant. These animals require large areas to roam and forage. Extensive habitat loss forces the elephants to enter plantations, feeding on the fronds of oil palms or simply traversing through to reach other forest fragments leading to an increased human-animal conflict. Another animal affected by a shrinking habitat is the endemic proboscis monkey, who reside largely near the water, such as in mangrove forest, riparian forests, and freshwater swamp forests. Proboscis monkeys have unusually large noses, the males even more so, using their pendulous noses to attract mates into their harem. These large noses create an echo chamber that are fought to amplify their calls for attracting females and to intimidate rivals. These charismatic primates are threatened by the clearing of mangroves and lowland forests for oil palm plantations. Their populations are estimated to have declined by about 50% in the last 40 years. Converting mangroves into oil palm plantations requires a huge investment to properly prepare the naturally tied inundated soil. Canals are dug to allow drainage and the dug out soil is used to elevate the height of the land for growing oil palm. This is an investment that only large oil palm companies could afford. However, Oil palm owners near the coast are now battling climate change and sea level rise. Oil palms do poorly in salt water, 
their growth is stunted and yield drops. Such is the case at Labuk Bay, and in recent years a new collaboration has started. An oil palm company has requested Saba Forestry Department to help restore a 17 hectare ex oil palm plantation, which would also benefit the proboscis monkey sanctuary that is owned by the oil palm company. Research is currently underway to overcome the changes to the hydrology of the wetland, to understand which mangrove species could survive at the restoration site, while simultaneously providing food sources for the proboscis monkey. Restoration of these habitats is no easy task, and will require significant investment in both time and money. As we continue to realise the true impact of our past activities and move towards a future of restoration, the question arises of where we will find the funding and ultimately who should foot the bill. Nature's bounty is a highly contested resource. People need to make a living and many often seek profits at the expense of other communities and the environment. Yet there are also those who live off the land and need healthy ecosystems. Going back to traditional ways, they have found sustainable livelihoods. As land use contestations continue and are compounded by climate change, who will ensure we carefully assess our future plans and will we learn from our past mistakes?